A prehistoric crime scene frozen for 110 million years. Inside a chunk of ancient limestone, paleontologists uncovered the chewed remains of a pint-sized pterosaur, still tangled in fossilized vomit, complete with acid burns and tooth marks. This is the only time science has ever found a flying reptile preserved within a dinosaur's last meal. But who killed Bakirabu Waritza, and why did the evidence end up spit out instead of digested? To unravel the truth, we follow the forensics from a museum drawer in Brazil into the jaws of a vanished Cretaceous predator. The fossil that would upend paleontology spent its first years in obscurity, tucked away in a climate-controlled drawer at the Museu de Paleontologia Placido Cidade Nuvens in Tiara, Brazil. It arrived not as a celebrity, but as an anonymous chunk of calcareous rock, just another nodule from the Romualdo Formation, logged during a routine quarrying sweep in the Ararat Basin. The field curator, known for a habit of labeling even the most unremarkable finds with a question mark, cataloged it as fragmentary pterosaur remains, uncertain context. For nearly two years, the specimen sat undisturbed, its secrets locked inside a pale limestone concretion flecked with tiny ostracode shells and foraminifera. The turning point came when a visiting researcher scanning the collection for overlooked vertebrate material noticed an odd density of bones pressed together in a split nodule. Unlike most fossil deposits, these bones were not scattered by water or time, they were clustered, hangled, and partially embedded in a matrix that looked suspiciously like fossilized organic debris. A closer look revealed a bizarre mix. Fragments of two tiny pterosaurs, four fish, and what appeared to be the chemical ghosts of stomach fluids. Validation required more than a sharp eye. The museum's lab team initiated a forensic chain of custody documenting every step from initial extraction through thin section petrography. The matrix mineralogy matched the Romualdo formation signature, a wackastone rich in microfossils, typical of Cretaceous lagoon muds. Independent CT scans confirmed the bones arrangement was not the result of fluvial transport or post-mortem scattering. The evidence pointed to a single violent event, regurgitation, not burial. With the preliminary findings in hand, the Brazilian team reached out to colleagues in Zimbabwe forming an international partnership that would prove essential. Together, they submitted the specimen for rigorous peer review. On November 10, 2025, their results appeared in scientific reports, cementing the fossil's legitimacy. The announcement drew global attention, but for those who handled the stone firsthand, the real astonishment came from the realization that paleontology's strangest case had been hiding in plain sight, waiting for someone to ask the right question. Bakiribu Wariza entered the scientific record with a name as improbable as its fate. The genus name Bakiribu draws from the local Kariri language and means flying one, a nod to the indigenous people who have lived in the Ararepe Basin for centuries. The species name Wariza comes from Shona and means vomit, a blunt but honest reference to the fossil's extraordinary context. Not everyone in the paleontology world was thrilled with the combination, but for the lead anatomist on the team, the name felt right a tribute to both the region's heritage and the fossil's bizarre journey through the digestive tract of a Cretaceous predator. Physically, Bakiribu Wariza was easy to overlook. With a wingspan of 40 to 50 centimeters, it was dwarfed by the soaring giants of its time. Its bones were paper-thin, hollow, and laced with air sacs, adaptations for powered flight that made the animal light enough to skim above ancient lagoons, but also fragile enough to be crushed by a single misjudged bite. The preserved skeleton includes delicate wing finger bones, a slender skull, and vertebrae so fine that even a gentle touch during fossil preparation risks shattering them. The lead anatomist described the bones as almost weightless in the hand, like the frame of a dragonfly scaled up. What truly sets Bakiribu apart is its mouth. Instead of the hooked fish snatching jaws seen in many of its relatives, this pterosaur's snout bristled with hundreds of needle-thin teeth arranged in dense comb-like rows. These teeth did not interlock to seize prey. Instead, they formed a living sieve. As Bakiribu glided just above the water, it would dip its elongated jaw and strain clouds of plankton, larvae, and tiny crustaceans from the surface, much like a flamingo or a baleen whale. The teeth were so fine and packed so closely that even the smallest aquatic organisms were trapped while water flowed back out. The jaw itself was slightly upturned, giving the animal a perpetual, almost comical smile. This feeding adaptation was more than a curiosity. It was a window into a lost ecological role. Before this discovery, filter feeding in pterosaurs was known from only a handful of species. 
none from tropical lagoons like those of the Romualdo Formation. Bakaribu's presence here revealed that early Cretaceous skies were not just ruled by predators and scavengers, but also by specialized plankton feeders, quietly shaping the food web from above. The fragility of its bones, the intricate structure of its teeth, and the very name it now bears all point to a life spent balancing on the edge, graceful, efficient, and as fate would have it, vulnerable in ways no one expected. Soon, those vulnerabilities would become the key to unlocking the fossil's forensic secrets. Under the cold fluorescence of the museum lab, the real story of Bakirabu Waridza began to surface. Not in the sweeping lines of its wings, but in the microscopic violence etched across its bones. A taphonomist trained to read the silent language of trauma and decay started with the wing fragments. Some bones gleamed with a clean, almost glassy surface. Others bore the telltale scars of acid, fine pitting, shallow grooves, and a faint, uneven dullness where digestive fluids had started their work. This was not the slow dissolution seen in fossils that lingered for days inside a predator's gut. Here, acid etching was patchy and mild, limited to the thinnest, most exposed areas. The thicker bones, and especially the teeth, remained pristine, their internal structure visible under thin section petrography, down to preserved pulp cavities and delicate dentine layers. The implication was clear. Bakiribu had spent little time inside a stomach, minutes to perhaps an hour, before being violently ejected. Fracture patterns told a parallel story. The wing bones and ribs showed green stick breaks, fresh, splintered fractures that only occur in living or recently killed animals. Spiral cracks twisted through the bone, evidence of torsion and sudden force, not the slow, crumbling collapse of long, buried remains. On the surface of one wing, the taphonomist counted a series of puncture marks, each 8 to 12 millimeters apart, perfectly round and conical. These were not the ragged tears of a scavenger or the random shattering of transport. They matched the spacing and shape of a predator's teeth, driven in with enough force to pierce, but not crush, the fragile skeleton. CT imaging reinforced the forensic case. Digital slices revealed that the bones were not only fractured, but also subtly compressed at the points of impact, as if gripped and twisted in a powerful jaw. There was no evidence of abrasion or water wear, just the fresh, localized trauma of a single violent encounter. The chemical analysis of the surrounding matrix found iron oxide staining and mineral signatures consistent with exposure to strong gastric fluids, but the reaction had not progressed far. The bones were ejected before acid could erase their finer details. All these clues, the limited acid etching, the green stick fractures, the precise tooth punctures, formed a forensic profile as distinctive as a fingerprint. The predator had not chewed its meal. It had seized, bitten, and swallowed Bakiribu nearly whole. Within an hour, the unsatisfying bony mass was expelled, tumbling into the lagoon. For the taphonomist, these patterns became the baseline. Any candidate for Bakiribu's killer would need to match this sequence of trauma, digestion, and regurgitation down to the millimeter. The evidence was set. The search for the suspect could begin. Three suspects emerge from the fossil record, each shadowed by evidence and, and doubt. First is Anhanguera, the pterosaur giant, wings stretching five meters across the ancient sky. Its jaws bristled with conical teeth, each spaced about one centimeter apart, close to the bite marks found on Bakiribu's bones. Anhanguera hunted fish, its teeth designed for gripping, not crushing. Predation on fellow pterosaurs is rare, and the energy gained from a small prey like Bakiribu seems minimal. Still, a desperate or opportunistic Anhanguera might have struck at a vulnerable target near the water's edge, especially if hunger outweighed caution. The dental match is close, but the behavioral fit is shaky. Next is Mawsonia, the massive Coelacanth. Three meters long, this lobe-finned fish haunted the depths of the Romualdo Lagoon, swallowing prey whole. Mawsonia's jaws could engulf a small pterosaur in one motion. Chemical traces in the regurgitate, strong gastric acid align with predatory fish digestion. Fossils from other sites show Mawsonia consuming birds and reptiles, but the Coelacanth's feeding style usually leaves little behind. Regurgitation is rare, a sign of distress or failed digestion. The scattered fish scales and partially digested bones in Bakiribu's remains hint at a chaotic meal, but the tooth marks do not match Mawsonia's broad blunt bite. The chemistry fits, the dental evidence less so. The third suspect is a marine crocodiliform, an ancient relative of crocodiles adapted for salt water. 
These predators ambushed prey with powerful jaws and teeth capable of piercing bone. Crocodiliforms are notorious generalists, eating almost anything they can catch. Their digestive systems often produce regurgitated bone clusters when prey proves indigestible. The bite force needed to splinter Bakirabu's bones matches their capabilities. Some era ripe. Basin fossils show croc teeth with spacing and shape similar to the punctures on the pterosaur. Yet the record is incomplete. No direct evidence places a marine crocodiliform at the scene, and their abundance in this lagoon remains uncertain. Without a matching jaw or gut contents, the link is circumstantial. A comparative odontologist weighs the clues. Anhangara's teeth fit, but its habits do not. Masonia's digestion matches, but its bite does not. The crocodiliform has the tools and the appetite, but lacks a confirmed presence. Each suspect answers some questions, but none close the case. The evidence demands a careful reconstruction of the attack, searching for the predator whose story best fits the violence preserved in Bakirabu's final moments. Bakirabu Waridza's final seconds played out with the cold efficiency of a prehistoric ambush. Hovering low over the lagoon, the pterosaur dipped its elongated jaw into the water, combing for plankton with teeth so fine they could trap a single larva. Wings stretched wide for balance, eyes fixed downward, Bakirabu was locked into the rhythm of feeding, oblivious to what lurked below. A behavioral ecologist calls this an evolutionary gamble. Every dip of the head, every second spent filtering at the surface, increased the odds of being noticed by a predator. The water surface, glassy and sunlit, offered no warning. Below, a shadow gathered speed. The strike happened in less than a minute. Evidence preserved in the fossil, fresh green stick fractures on the wing bones, and conical puncture marks spaced just a few centimeters apart, points to a single, forceful bite. The predator's jaws clamped around Bakirabu's torso and the base of a wing, snapping bone but not shattering it. There was no drawn-out struggle. The pterosaur was yanked under, lungs flooding, life ending in a rush of water and pressure. Within moments, the predator swallowed its prize. The meal proved a disappointment. Thin bones, little flesh, a beak full of keratin. Digestive fluids began their work, etching some bones while leaving others untouched. In less than an hour, the predator regurgitated the remains. The vomit, still tangled with fish scales and pterosaur fragments, sank rapidly through 10 meters of water, coming to rest in anoxic mud that would preserve its secrets for 110 million years. A fossil's journey from predator's stomach to museum drawer is rarely so fortuitous or so revealing. In most cases, delicate creatures like Bakaribu Waridza vanish without a trace, their hollow bones and fine teeth destroyed by scavengers, decay, or the grinding churn of time. Here, the odds reversed. The regurgitated remains, expelled in haste, plummeted through 10 to 15 meters of ancient lagoon water, landing in a zone where oxygen was scarce and bacterial decay stalled. Fine carbonate mud blanketed the tangle of bones and fish scales almost immediately, locking the entire episode into a microcosm of Cretaceous life and death. Rapid burial and anoxic conditions did what millions of years of natural selection could not. They preserved the most fragile anatomical details, from the comb-like teeth to the faintest acid-etched scars. This kind of preservation is so rare that it forces a reconsideration of how paleontologists search for lost species. Regurgitalites, fossilized vomit, capture animals that almost never fossilize by other means. They freeze a moment of ecological interaction, not just isolated skeletons. For Bakirabu, the vomit became a time capsule, preserving not only the victim but a snapshot of the food web itself. The lesson is humbling. The fossil record is not just shaped by grand catastrophes or slow burial, but by the unpredictable quirks of biology and chemistry, sometimes by what a predator could not stomach. Every regurgitolite is a reminder that nature's waste can become science's treasure, and that the next paradigm-shifting discovery might be hiding in the most overlooked places. Peer review for Bakirabu Waridza was less a formality than a gauntlet. The lead author, accustomed to the usual skepticism that greets new fossil taxa, found himself fielding questions that bordered on the surreal. At least three reviewers independently suspected a prank, and one even asked for photographic proof that the fossil was not a cleverly arranged art project. To satisfy the scrutiny, the team shipped thin sections and CT scan data to labs in Sao Paulo, Harar, and London.
Each institution dissected the evidence, confirming the regurgitolite context, the filter feeding anatomy, and the absence of telltale glue or tampering. Only after every pixel and micrograph was accounted for did the manuscript move forward. Then came the debate over the species' name. Some colleagues cringed at the idea of immortalizing vomit in Latinized form, worrying it might cheapen the discovery. The lead author, unmoved, argued that scientific names should tell the truth, no matter how unpalatable. In the end, consensus landed with the honest approach. Bakiribu Waridza, a name that captures both local heritage and the fossil's unforgettable journey. The process was grueling, but it left no doubt. The strangest pterosaur in the world had earned its place in the scientific record, regurgitation and all. Quarry trucks rumble across the Araripe Basin every day, carving deeper into the Romualdo Formation in search of limestone. This relentless excavation has already stripped away thousands of tons of fossil-rich rock, and the pace is only increasing. Recent reports estimate that active quarrying now covers more than 40 square kilometers, with new extraction permits issued each year. Conservationists warn that the very layers preserving Bakiribu Waridza and its ancient neighbors are vanishing faster than scientists can study them. In response, a coalition of Brazilian paleontologists and local advocates has launched a campaign to expand protected zones and to restrict commercial quarrying in key fossil areas. Petitions calling for emergency conservation status have gathered over 100,000 signatures while international attention from the Bakiribu discovery has sparked a surge in research funding. For many, the fossil's improbable survival inside a predator's vomit is a stark reminder. Every lost outcrop could hold another story waiting to be told. The future of this prehistoric treasury now depends on choices made in the present. Even now, a single fossil in ancient vomit can rewrite what we know about prehistoric life. As new techniques reveal secrets hidden in the unlikeliest places, the boundaries of paleontology expand, often in ways we never expect. The next breakthrough may lie where no one dares to look. Nature keeps its strangest stories in the details we almost overlook. What else waits in the evidence we haven't examined?